Okay guys, today on the bench we've got the uh, SG-165. Uh, it's about time that I uh, need to use this on for some things. It's been a while since I've used it. And I thought before I just started using it again, I'd take the opportunity to open this thing up and, and just check the uh, calibration on a few things. I can't check calibration on everything. I don't have all the equipment necessary to really calibrate things around the multiplexing and things like that. But I can check a few things. Um, I've done a few things to this over the years. I've, I've like added some you know, adapters for BNC to RCA because I haven't changed these out to to uh, BNC connectors yet. I still got the original probes that came with this that attached the RCA connectors, so I just got around to doing most of that. Um, this has the same issue that I've seen XRay20B and others talk about. It's got the same known issue is that this the shaft for this pod is broken. And you know, to be honest, I don't really use it for this because uh, I would probably want to be taking this and putting this in with a, a frequency counter anyway. So I have already my, uh, my uh, signal generator that has the frequency counter attached to it that I'll probably use anyway. So I, I really don't need it for this. I may fix it someday, but probably not in this video. Uh, what I'm primarily interested in this in is for just doing the FM sweep, for sweeping the FM uh, around 10.7, throwing the markers on it so I can check FM... Uh, you know, IF can tuning and the discriminators. So anyway, uh, I thought I'd check that out, make sure that the 10.7 is still kind of where it needs to be and so forth. And while I've got it open, I'll check a few things that I can check. Uh, I have the uh, manual on this, uh, and so I just check through what I can check and just see what it does. I haven't ever done the the caps in the power supply on this. Uh, it, I'm sure it needs to be done by now. Uh, but uh, anyway, I just thought we'd just open it up and see how it looks. I think one of the things I'm going to do though is hook it up to an oscilloscope and just see how it performs right now so we'll have something to look at later if we change some things, you know, maybe how it maybe improved the performance. So I'll get that set up. Okay, I got the oscilloscope, one of my oscilloscopes set up here. And the cord and the cord storage is in the back if you haven't seen one of these. We get this plugged in and then we'll bring you back when I get the cables hooked up. Okay, so I've got it running the device under test. It's going through the isolation transformer and so forth. And I've got 120 volts on it here. This is plugged into the house main. So it's, this is not isolated, but this is. Okay, so what we have it set on here is 10.7 megahertz IF. And here is 10.7 megahertz crystal controlled. Uh, that is about as fast as my uh, trigger will go on this scope. But I've got a decent trace. It looks nice and sharp. I can see it. Of course, if I go to sweep and markers, you know, it's fuzzing out. If I go to RF, I don't see anything. Now, it could be that this isn't putting up much output, but that's typically not a very high output signal there. If I go to RF, turn the modulation off. It's doing some kind of frequency right now, whatever the uh, RF frequency broke at. And then it's starting to wig out a little bit. So here is 455 kilohertz. Take the case off. You first start with these uh, two screws on either side of the case wrap on the bottom. And there's a couple on the top. So you get a couple, two out of the top. And then you pull the cables out of the back because they're going to need to thread through. These are the ones that go to the speaker connections for your outputs. Okay, now we can check the inside of this. This instrument is 100% made right. We got some guys' names on here. cord bundle. And so let's see what we got. We got our power supply board up here on top. Or at least part of it. I have to check to see what we can check here. We've got a couple of the adjusters. I believe one of these has to do with the uh, sweep or more phasing I should say. The phase. And the rest of the power supply is inside here where the oscillator is. Yeah, we got some connections over here as well. 
Very clean though, as you can see, I think. And let's see if we can show you the broken shaft. This is definitely broken there. If you can see, I am going to make it where you can. Let's see, there it is. There's a break right there. There's the break right there in that rod made of nylon or Delrin or something. There, I'm kind of making it get out of position. You can see it maybe a little bit better there. There you go. You can see it there. See? There you go. There's that broken rod. And maybe we can fix that. I don't know if I'll fix it today or not, but uh, that'll need to be fixed. Okay, we're going to get this thing set back up. I'm going to go through the troubleshooting and not troubleshooting, but the uh, calibration procedure and see what all we can do. Get a little bit of crustiness here on this, uh, what is that, 1000 microfarad? Yeah, a little bit of crustiness there. We'll see. I may check the ripple too. We'll see what we get. Okay, so I've got my uh, instructions out here and it's telling me to disconnect the Molex plug carrying the power supply outputs from the feed through capacitors on the side of the main shield of the assembly. That's the power supply board. And so I'm going to pull this Molex connector out. Okay, how will it go back in? Alright, there is markings on the silk screen in here. If you can see that, it says R R G Y. So I've got R R G Y. So we know which way that goes. So I disconnected this. I need to disconnect this one down here on the side. Not sure that one needs to be disconnected. We'll see. Oh yeah, from the side of the main shield of the assembly, so that's this one. Okay, and this one's polarized and it's got a gap here and there's a gap here. So we know which way that goes. Alright, that stays with this. That makes sense. Now, it says, leave the power supply and fuse bracket mounted to the shield cover. So this is the power supply and this is the fuse bracket. Remove the four sheet metal screws that secure the cover to the shield of assembly. Well, let's see, there's one here. Okay, it looks like when we take this off, we're supposed to remove it and pivot it this way so that this is facing forward. That allows us to leave these connected and just swivel it around out of the way. So we'll get started on that. So here. Okay, let's see how this goes. Make some space here. Okay, we got those four screws that hold the shield on. All right, lift up. Sorry to block your view. Okay, it says we are now ready. <laughs> right, so let's take a look inside. Got some contacts we can clean for sure. So this is the main function switch in here for changing whether we're doing AM, FM, uh, and so forth. All the different switches are in there. Let me try to clean those a little bit. And then we got some of the main power capacitors down and some other power capacitors here. You can get a better look at the broken shaft right in there perhaps. Okay, I'm ready to start going through the calibration checks on this. I'm going to start off first with measuring the uh, the, the uh, 12 voltage, 12 volts on either side of the output capacitors uh, from the power supply. And what makes things really fun is that these capacitors um, 
the silk screen capacitor numbers do not match the numbers that are shown in the calibration procedure. So for example, capacitor 105 is represented by C5 and C6 is 106 in the calibration procedures. But we'll just work our way through that. Anyway, so we'll, we'll work through that. Okay, so what we're going to do is, I believe this is 5. Yeah, this is 5 or 105, and then this is 6 over here. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to check to see what the output voltage is at the back side of, or the positive side of C105. And that is here. Okay, I'm measuring 12.8. Okay, 12.8 volts there. So now we go to the, it's the negative side. Negative side is C106. C106 is over here. So that's 12.8. And 12.88. Pretty close. It says though you can adjust R113 negative voltage equal value to measure at the negative lead of 106. Okay, so 113 is the capacitor that's up here by these regulators. And I'll see if I can get in there and adjust those. Or it. Let's see if I've got a tweaker. So we want this to say 12.8. Okay, 12.8, 12.79. This one is, we've got to match 12.79 positive, and 12.79 negative. Okay, so we got that first part done. Also, I thought it would be interesting if you wanted to check to see maybe what the ripple looks like here. Um, I've got my other oscilloscope set up. Let me take a look at it. So let me uh, hook this up. I'll hook this up to the positive side of 105. Okay, and if I bring you around, hang on your hat, I'm going to swing you around here. Okay. So you can see we've got a couple of ripples going on here. We got, I think, uh, I think I see a generally large wave here, and then we got a smaller wave here. Uh, I don't know what the frequency of that is. I don't have it. I don't have a display here. But if you look here, I've got this set at what is that? Five millivolts. I have this set on the X1. Okay, so I'm about what is that? Five millivolts peak to peak for uh, that ripple. I'm going to work with that for now. Yes, it definitely needs to be re, you know recapped, but I'm not going to do that right now. I'll check the ripple on the other capacitor, expected to be somewhere. So this is at the negative side of 106. Same kind of display, same kind of magnitude. Yeah, I could use being recapped, but I bet you it'll work. So let's just keep working. Let's keep going forward. Okay, what I'm doing now is checking the output of the 400 hertz sine wave. Uh, I've hooked this up to the frequency generator. Well, first of all, I have it plugged in to the all signals out in the front. I'll, I'll set up a picture of that uh, pointed out to you. It's in the lower left-hand corner. Um, so then what I've done is I've, I've hooked it up to my frequency counter. It doesn't really matter what it is. It's 400 uh, hertz. I'm measuring 390 hertz on my uh, frequency counter, so that's close enough. I'm pretty sure. All right, so then what we're doing is we're just checking the level output. I have the microvolts knob. Uh, turned up all the way on the side of it and it just says to adjust this little trimmer right here 
for 1 volt RMS. See if we can get this to read 1 volt RMS adjusting right here. It's going higher. Let's go the other way. Taking quite a bit of turn. Turn it up and let it stabilize a little bit. One volt RMS. All right. So now we're going to do is go to the uh, 67 kilohertz one, although I don't need that one. Let's just see, do I want to do this? Okay, in this one, what they want to do is to adjust the coil 307 uh, for the 67 kilohertz oscillator coil for an output frequency of 67 kilohertz. Okay, so what I can do is change probes and take that to my frequency counter. Okay, I've got my mess set up here to where we can see what we're doing. So I found the right size tweaker and we want to get that to be 67 kilohertz. You see the blinker is blinking, which means that's in uh, kilohertz. Okay. So let's adjust this coil to get 67. If it wants to move, I don't want to force it. I don't want to force it. 66.8 is close enough. I'm going to keep it at that. Okay, what we're doing now is we're doing the uh, calibration for the 10.7 megahertz. So what we're doing first of all is I've got the switches set in the front according to what they want me to do. So I've got uh, the, outputs, um, the output switch set to 10.7 megahertz. I have the rocker, the AM FM rocker centered. And I've got the uh, 400 megahertz switches off and the pilot signal off. And I've connected a DC voltmeter to the positive lead of C303, which is right in here. I post a picture of it. And then we want to do is uh, measure a output of six volts DC. So what we're getting there is with respect to the chassis. So that's at 7.19. I'm going to make sure we're connected. Yeah, we're connected to the chassis. Okay. So in order to get that adjusted, we adjust three R three O six. R three O six is right in front of it. And I don't have any way to get a screwdriver on that. So I guess I'm going to have to do it by hand. We're looking right here, right? Anybody want to call that close enough? Six volts DC. Okay. Okay, so we got six volts there. So now what we need to do is attach a frequency counter to the all signals output and tweak to get exactly 10.7. Yes, currently at 10.4 currently. So let's see if we can get that to read 10.7. I'm going to kill this bright light so we can see the counter better. We go to that location right there and adjust this to be 10.7. Let's 
what's going on here. It's going all over the place. No, I'm not getting a strong enough signal out here to know if that's what I'm getting out of here or not. Let's see. I should be at 2.7. Yep. So if I go to the crystal, I'm getting a good enough signal out to hold it for 10.7. But if I go to the other setting, it's just 10.7. It's kind of all over the place. Let me see what it looks like on the scope. It looks like this scope is jumping around a little bit when I mess with the switch. So that's that's the 10.7 crystal. Uh, and I'm able to pick that up on the frequency counter. Now when I switch to the non-crystal to here, for some reason it's not triggering on that, but if I mess with the switch a little bit, I was getting some weird shapes there. It's not doing it now. So let me switch back to the frequency counter. Yeah, I may I have a little suspicion about this cable. We'll see. Back to the frequency counter. Ah, now it's working. All right. Before something else changes, Let's see if we can get this to 10.7. Wrong way. Oh, here we go. Wigging out. Okay, let me try the switch thing. Crystal? Non crystal. 10.35. Okay. What do I got to do? Switch off and come back? I'm thinking it's because maybe I've had the shielding off. So that's crystal, non-crystal. Crystal, non-crystal. Oscillator. Okay, 10, 3, 8. Wrong way. Go counterclockwise now. Crystal. Not a crystal. Let me go back to the scope again. Let's see if I can see changes over here when I'm turning the pot or the coil. Uh, crystal, non crystal, crystal, non crystal. Now when I touch it, yeah, looky here, I've got a bad connection or something. That's a problem. There's something wrong with the oscillator.
that's our problem right there guys So right there, if I don't touch the unit, I'm not a big fan of that either. If I bring that back over the frequency counter, I get 10.34. If I touch this, I don't have them both hooked up. I'm, only, I'm hooked up to one or the other. And that's where it freaks out. And you saw that. I connect that to here. Got nothing. But now I touch this. push down on it do that I'm pushing down on it and I'm making the adjustment 10.7 so does that mean I've got a bad solder connection in there But now it's not reading 10.7 anymore. And the more I push on it, it's changing it. And that sucks. Crystal controlled, off crystal controlled, crystal controlled, off crystal controlled. Well, I may have a bad connection in there, or maybe the switches are messed up, but I, I suspect there's something wrong with the board in here. So I press on just the board. board itself doesn't seem to be the problem. Now I'm going to just try it, see how that works. I may have to tear this all apart again and maybe get in there and work on some other stuff, but um, I think I'm going to try to let this let this work and we'll just see how it does. So crystal controlled and then what we just adjusted. Hey guys, this is the future back with you. I was going through editing this video and I was noticing that when I was doing the calibration of the the 10.7 coil, I kept comparing it back and forth between the selector that showed 10.7 due to an internal crystal uh, to a 10.7 generated by the coil in there and that I was adjusting. And you'll notice that I was using this little frequency counter to figure out what the 10.7 should be. But you may have noticed that when I flip over to the crystal, this would read 10.6. A, a, a reasonable question would be, you know, man, maybe this isn't right, you know, that if this is reading a crystal that's supposed to be 10.7, 
this should be saying 10.7. So if, if, if this instead says 10.6, maybe you ought to be adjusting that coil so that it agrees with what this says would be at 10.6, even though it's actually 10.7, if you see what I'm saying. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a valid point. I, I, I do understand about calibration. I, in part of my career, I know a lot about calibration and calibration standards and frequency and, and so forth. So I, you know, I know about how these things will have to go back to standards and so forth. Um, and I'm not saying that I've got any of that here, all right? I, I realize that. Uh, but I will say that I do have this thing here. And there's crystals and then there's crystals. Um, and I'm not getting into the battle of the crystals here. But I will say that crystals can vary with uh, temperature. This is, a, this is a synthesizer that synthesizes the... The frequencies we're trying to see and it has this particular one has I believe it's options four and five in it and one of those options uh, I don't remember which I think it might have been five uh, means that this thing has an oven in it that maintains the temperature of the reference crystal there's a reference crystal in here that it uses to check itself um, that it keeps it at a stable temperature and so that it's it holds it more accurately now as long as this thing stays plugged in, whether this is turned on or not, it uh, it actually is keeping the oven hot at all times. You see, it doesn't actually say power on, power off. It says power standby. So it's it actually has the oven in on all the time. And do I need that kind of accuracy? Of course not. Of course not. This thing turns out much more accuracy than I would ever need or want and so forth. But it's it's probably... A bit more reliable in terms of what kind of of frequency I'm getting. So I thought it'd be interesting just to kind of compare, you know, what this frequency counter gives us on what this is supposedly putting out, just as a way to see, you know, is there a reason to believe this is probably pretty good? All right. Another thing to consider is 10.9 versus 10.7 in the grand scheme of things. When you look at the blurry traces I'm looking at, does it really matter? You know, it might not really matter, okay? But I just thought somebody might be interested to, to take a look at that. All right, so I'm going to turn this on. Once again, I've, I've rigged this up through something that X-Ray Tony B did, which was a fantastic video. I run this off of uh, my little, uh, my other frequency generator that I use. It has uh, modulation it puts on it. I have a buck converter inside. I run the power directly off of the other frequency generator and I have it usually plugged in directly to it. It's, it's a great video. I'll put the link to it in the notes. It's just, I, I, I link to it all the time because it's been probably one of the most helpful videos I've seen. Okay, so I know I'm going to have to kind of get this to where I can see what you see here. So I've got this plugged in to the, uh, let me turn it just a little bit. So I've got this plugged in to the uh, HP I think you can kind of see here. All right, so this thing's just kind of hunting around. It doesn't really see or feel anything. So let me turn it on. Okay, now it comes on at 10K hertz. Now, first thing you notice is this is reading zero. And that's because this thing comes on at a very low amplitude, okay? Minus 73 dB, all right? So this isn't able to see it or trigger on it yet. So I'm gonna have to turn the, the amplitude up, all right? The first one I'm gonna do is go in, and I'll put in 10.7 megahertz. So I just key in 10.7 and hit megahertz, all right? So that's 10.7 megahertz, all right? This doesn't see it because the amplitude is not high enough. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'll go to amplitude, and I'm going to modify that to bring the amplitude up. So what I'm going to do is say modify on. Maybe may be hard to see, but the 9 is blinking. I'm going to step over to the 7. The 7 is now blinking. So now I'm going to bring the, I'll bring it on up. Okay, that's nice and loud. <laughs> so now you can see, go back to frequency, we're getting 10.7 megahertz. I can modify the frequency. This zero is blinking currently. And step over to six and make that a six. See, this is reading 10.6. And go 10.5. 10.7. 10.8. Look at the level of significant digits on this. All right. They are significant because I can step them down. I can say, all right, let's go to 10 point, I'm turning it, 6 point, 10.6. Can you see that? 
So I think that this is reading very accurately. And that was one of the comments that Tony made in his videos. He says, look, I have Tony, I think I'm paraphrasing Tony. He says, look, I've got some amazing instruments here. And he does a lot of cool work. He, and he professionally works on x-ray machines. And so he has got some very accurate machines. He says he's checked the livid daylights of this thing and it's spot on. Okay. And it certainly seems to be. So did it make any difference that the crystal in the SG-165 said 10.6 and this said 10.7? No, I don't think it really matters is all I'm really saying. I wasn't worried that, that this was saying 10.6 on the crystal but saying 10.7 when I was adjusting it because I was actually trusting this based on the experience I've had working with this. So anyway, I hope that uh, made some sense. I just thought you might find that interesting to see that these things are actually pretty good. All right, thanks. Let's get back to the video. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to connect up uh, on the 10.7 megahertz sweep and markers. We're going to check the output selector to sweep and markers. Okay. Set to sweep and markers. Okay, and then we connect frequency counter to a jumper. I'll show you a picture of where it is in there in just a minute. It's really hard to see. And this is going to the frequency counter. Okay. We should be seeing 100 kilohertz. You can see the light is blinking. So we're at 98 kilohertz. Okay. So we can adjust L305 to get 100 kilohertz. L305 is right here. We'll see if we can get 100 kilohertz. kilohertz okay we okay, came ready to attempt the last uh, calibration I'm going to try to do on this which has to do with trying to uh, get a circular pattern on the XY on the oscilloscope you can see what we've got going over here so what I'm done is I've connected to pin 3 for the uh, vertical and pin 2 for the horizontal and then we need to do is adjust R103 on the power supply board which is over here uh, to get a circular output for a 90 degrees phase shift. All right, the adjustment, I'm going to turn the light on again. The adjustment is this guy right here. So I'm going to adjust this pot here to get a circle. Get you set back up. Okay, so you'll watch the circle over here. All right, let me see if I can get a screwdriver in there. That's not the one. That's not the one. This one might work. Yeah, see if we can get anything a little more circular in that. It's pretty close, All right? I think I've got it turned all the way. So that's the wrong way. And that's as far as it'll go. 
right. There. Okay. All right, so that's as far as I'm going to go with calibration of this. I don't have uh, a lot of the instruments that I might need to do things more around the multiplexing and separation and so forth. I'm not going to be worrying about that right now anyway. So I do have some kind of problem with the connection in here on the uh, that coil for doing the 10.7. Uh, I'm going to put it back together again and we'll see how it works. Uh, if I need to, I may have to tear this all apart, apart and get in there and clean all the switches and check for bad solder connections and so forth. But for right now it's holding, so we'll just see how it does. Uh, in terms of fixing the shaft in here on the RF control, I'm not going to do that right now. I may do it someday, but I really don't need it. Uh, and you have to do some things to pull this board back to get in there and then fix it. I know it can be done, uh, and I should do it, but I have, I'm not going to do it right now. But when I do, I'm going to go in and probably recap the unit anyway, so I can get some stabilization on things I don't have currently also. Anyway, so I'll put this thing back together again now. Okay, I have the SG-165 set up in 10.7 uh, sweep mode. Uh, going in through uh, the matching pad. I got an aftermarket one because the other ones are just kind of old. And uh, it's going into the grid of the FM converter tube. Ground is to the chassis. And then the detector is hooked up here. I've disconnected the uh, stabilizing capacitor and grounded it here. I'm on the other side of the detector diode and I'm feeding that into the oscilloscope. So what's happening is this is producing the sweep signal. It comes out of the all outputs, goes into the matching pad, goes into the mixer. The detector probe picks that up and then brings it into the from detector port on the SG-165. It then puts a post marker on it and then sends that signal to the oscilloscope that can go into uh, input 1 or input A, channel 1, uh, into the oscilloscope. So what we have is we have a sweep signal going through uh, the FM section. So let me see if I can zoom in and we can see. All right. So what I'm going to do is disconnect the from detector. So there's the markers. Okay. If I move them up on the screen, there's the markers. So I've got it positioned in the center uh, of the sweep. So that's between these two marks. And then you can move the rocker on the SG-165 to center that in the middle of that part. So I've got that marked. I can change the height of the markers, like so. Okay. The one in the middle that's real bright right then, is 10.7. The one to the left is 10.6. The one to the right is 10.8. Okay, now what I'm going to do is plug in the from detector back in. So I can change by changing the uh, output, the SG-165, the intensity of what's coming out of that probe. Let's turn it up. I've got it set on the times 100 so it's around 850 is about where it's got set right here millivolts I'm sure that's not calibrated but it's what it is on what the dial reads okay so am I really getting what I expected to see well no not really I mean uh, I would like to have seen more of a hump there and less of a sharp spike but this is showing the the way the SG-165 is sweeping and we're getting the sweep signal through. Okay. Now I can mess with the uh, IF transformers to see if I can get more of a hump uh, from that location. And then also, I won't show it right now, but if I hooked it up, I need to rehook up the stabilizing capacitor, and then I can hook up to uh, another location further downstream, and then see if I get the butterfly curve uh, out of the detector. So now what I've done is used a jumper to basically reconnect the stabilizing capacitor across the um, the two diodes that are in the back end of the detector of the uh, discriminator to connect those back, and then I moved the um, the detector di uh, pad or connector over to position B in the schematic, so that I can start to see what the output of the of the um, discriminator is, and. I think we got a pretty good look at it over here. 
So here you can see the output of the discriminator like we're supposed to. Uh, change the size of scale. It had been about like this or so and I also had the marker turned up too high. So I was getting this initially. So I turned the marker down, brought the scale up and so what you're seeing is is that it's crossing it's crossing right in the middle between the two widths of the of the trace between here and here. Zero, zero cross is right in the middle and the amplitude on either side of it is basically the same and it's symmetrical. I could probably do a little bit better down here. I want to reduce the size of the markers further and I can also change the output of the signal. It could be maybe just a little bit more on the low side. Let's see if I can get this centered. Yeah, it's quite a bit higher on one side than the other, so I could probably adjust the discriminator some a little bit. Okay, so it's all back together again. Hopefully before too long I have a chance to show you working on a uh, FMIF uh, sweep, and then we'll see how this thing works for us. Thanks for watching. Talk to you later. Bye.